O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Once again, it's Wednesday evening, and it's time for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Uh, if you would please get your pen, your paper, and your Bibles. And we're going to pick up in Exodus 37 on the scene. We're going to do our best to march from Exodus 37 all the way up to Exodus 39 on the scene. And we only just want to hit the highlights. Uh, I'm going to do our best not to go into detail, uh, to just skim the surface. Uh, because if we go into any type of real detail, uh, we'll be spending another few weeks trying to make it to chapter 40. Uh, which is where I want to get to in dealing with the dedication of the new tabernacle. Uh, last week we looked at chapters uh, 35 and 36 in the beginning to deal with the tabernacle. And then chapters 37 and 38 and 39, there's a continuation of them building the tabernacle, building all the furniture, and, and building the priest's garments in this process in these next three chapters. So we kind of want to walk through this the best that we can without getting traced in too deep. I know by now you've already read the chapter, so you can follow along relatively easily. Uh, and if you have any other key questions, you can bring those up and we'll do our best to answer those particular key questions on next week for you. Uh, we'll do our best. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity of just allowing us to come together and to share. We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity that we can share with each other on Zoom, Lord God, we thank you for the time that we can study your word together, Lord God. We ask, Father, for the spiritual insight that is needed for us on tonight, Lord God. Father, feed us with your word, Lord God, with exactly what you have in store for us, Lord God. And we ask, Father God, that you administer to us in a way that only you can, Lord God. Meet the needs you see that needs to be met, Lord God. Lift us up, encourage us, inspire us, and strengthen us, Lord God. And Father, we'll ever be so careful to give your name the praise and glory and the honor in Jesus name we pray amen all right um they have a saying that uh, ignorance is bliss now this may be something can be true in real trivial matters uh, ignorance is not bliss if it is keeping a person from making progress if it keeps you from moving ahead if it keeps you from succeeding by embracing a much needed truth. This is certainly true when dealing with the Lord. A person who is ignorant about God suffers a great handicap. A person who cannot relate to God has no concept about how holy and awesome God is. A person who cannot relate to God has no idea how merciful and loving God is. A person who cannot relate to God has no answer to the emptiness and the loneliness he feels in his heart. A person who cannot relate to God has no solution for the meaningless tasks of life. A person who cannot relate to God has no solution to the meaningless tasks of life. A person who cannot relate to God has no direction or God as he walks through the dark days of life. A person who cannot relate to God has no power outside of himself. A person who cannot relate to God has no hope at the end of this life. A person who cannot relate to God has no assurance, no absolute certainty of living eternally. The greatest challenge faced by man is just this to learn how to relate to God. But I want you to understand that the task of learning about God is too great for man to do by himself. So God provides a way for man to learn about him, the way to approach him. And that's what this section of scripture is all about. It's laying out a way, a pathway, in order for you and I to approach God. Let's walk through Exodus 37 here. In verses 1 through 5, you will find they are making the ark of God that symbolizes the throne and the presence of God. The ark of God, the ark or the throne of God was made of a, a cake.
acacia wood it overlaid with pure gold both inside and outside was inlaid with pure gold uh, the, the, the ark had four ring gold rings on it one on each corner of the ark um, they made two poles with the acacia wood and they overlaid it with pure gold now I, and just coincidentally uh, at that time that the acacia tree, the acacia tree was more popular in Africa and places like uh, Australia but nowadays they have like some over 1,000 variations of the acacia tree so a branch and sometimes as it is called um, these poles were being inserted into the rings to carry the Ark of the Covenant which means no one could actually physically touch the Ark of the Covenant if you remember when uh, the Philistines put the Ark of the Covenant on a uh, new cart and they were carrying it and they got it over to, to the people of God and they were carrying it and, and, and the Ark was about to fall off the cart and one of the men had reached out and touched the Ark of the Covenant and he got killed as a result of touching the Ark of the Covenant and that's why the rings and the poles were so crucial that was the only way that they could move and handle the Ark of the Covenant in verses six through nine, you see them were well, they making the the, uh, the mercy seat or the atonement cover for the Ark of the Covenant. Now, every aspect of the mercy seat symbolizes and it speaks of the mercy and forgiveness and atonement and reconciliation. The mercy seat was made out of pure gold, symbolizing deity. Remember, not only God can forgive sin, and that was the mercy seat. Uh, then verses 10 through 19 there was a table of showbread and it symbolizes God as the bread of life uh, only God can satisfy a man constant craving to feel his empty heart uh, it, located in the holy place behind the outer veil the table of showbread pointed to one of man's most important needs the need to be fed, the need to feed his hunger for God. And that was the table of showbread. Now there's other part that goes with it, but we won't try to get into all of that. The table was made out of the acacia wood and it was also covered and overlaid with pure gold. Uh, it, it, it sat on a table that was covered with pure gold as well. Uh, so they spared no expense and building the furnishing inside of the Ark of the Covenant. So uh, just like you, you know, you're building your home. Uh, um, you, you, you're building your brand new home. You're not going to spare expenses. You're going to make sure you put the best of everything in your brand new home that you desire, that you want within it. And it's very similar here in building the uh, house of God. In verses 11 through 24, um, they have what's known as the lampstand. The lampstand symbolizes God as the light of the world. God as the light of the world. Remember now, the lampstand basically the the only light that they would have on the inside of the uh, tabernacle. Uh, one of the most significant attributes of God is light. Without light, the world would be lost in darkness. No one could see the way, the purpose, meaning, and significance of light. Light helps men to see the way and the truth and what life is all about. The actual lampstand itself was made of one piece of pure hammered gold. Pure hammered gold. One piece of gold made the base, the shaft, uh, the six branches, the lamp cups, the buds, and the blossom. The six branches was made with three branches on each side of the, the center shaft or the staff. Uh, the seven lamps and accessories were made of pure gold. The lamps, the lamp stand, the lamps, and all accessories were made from 75 pounds of pure gold. My God. Um, verses 25 through 29, uh, they had the altar of incense. And as you remember, the altar of incense uh, was made of acacia wood. The altar was covered with pure gold including the top the sides the horns and the molding uh, the two rings 
were made and placed on each side for carrying the, the altar. The carrying poles were made of acacia wood and overlaid with gold. The anointing oil and fragrance and incense were made by steel fragrance, steel perfume artists. Uh, the altar of incense symbolizes the prayers and communion of God's people ascending up to God and pleasing Him. Now that's, in a nutshell, that's chapter 37. Now let's go, go roll quickly into chapter 38 because it's continuing where chapter 37 left off at. In verses 1 through 7 of chapter 38, there was the altar of burnt offerings that symbolizes the need for atonement and reconciliation with God. And verse 8 of chapter 38, you have the bronze wash basin that symbolizes the washing away of sin, the cleansing and forgiveness of sin. In verses 9 and 20, uh, there was the courtyard that symbolizes the great truth. God can be approached, but you have to approach him correctly. In verses 30, 21 through 31, there was the list of the inventory. And this is something that really kind of blows me away when I look back at it, how detailed, oriented they were in keeping notes with what they were doing and who was doing what and who was responsible for what on the inside of building the tabernacle. So they kept excellent records. Moses was a great record keeper in this process. There was military use in building the tabernacle. The list of inventory shows how faithful God's people were in their labor for God. Note that Moses, always a precise writer, summarized everything that went into the building of the tabernacle. The master checklist itemized important details, you know, such as the Levites, who were primarily the dominant figure keepers in this process, you know, the record keepers, uh, the record keepers, you know, who were the superintendent, who was the assistant superintendent in doing all the building and who, who whose land or lineage you were from, what family lineage they were from, you know, uh, 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 the family lineage they were a part of. Um, he kept up with the offering of gold that was taken up through a wave offering. I mean, the total amount of gold to build the tabernacle was 2,200 pounds of gold and built inside of the tabernacle. Um, there was the offering of silver, which was a total of 7,545 pounds. And there was an offering of bronze of 5,310 different pounds, okay? Now, that's chapter 38. Next, we have chapter 39. And chapter 39 deals with the making of the priest's garments, the garments of the priest Aaron and his son's garments. Now, verse one tells us that the the sacred garment symbolizes the deity and honor of God's call. Uh, and, and if you want to look at that, you can go all the way back to Exodus 28, where we talked about that in Exodus 28, 1 through 5, when we talked about that in, in some detail back there. Um, note the particular facts about these specific clothing. The garments were made from purple, blue, and scarlet yarn. They were also, or they were, they were ordinary garments. Their sole purpose was for ministering in the holy place. The garments were made just as God commanded them. Uh, verse 2 through 7 in Exodus 39, it talks about the Ephraim. Uh, you know, they made the Ephraim for them. Now, the Ephraim that the priest represented, and the Ephraim symbolizes that the priest represented and carried the names of God's people before the Lord. The ephraim was made of blue, purple, scarlet yarn and fine linen. Uh, the ephraim was made by hammering out thin sheets of gold, then, then were cut into thin strips. These strips were then worked into the yarn and the linen, or the lining, or the clothing. The shoulder pieces were made and attached to the two corners of the ephraim. The waistboard was made as one piece 
with the ephraim and was made of the multicolored yarn and linen. The waist piece was made exactly as God commanded them to make. And they had the two onyx stones were mounted in gold, really finger gold, finger flinch setting, in our gold flinch setting. Uh, the names of Israel's 12 tribes were engraved on the stones. The stones were then fastened to the shoulder piece of the Ephraim. And that is exactly how God had commanded it to be made. In Exodus 39, 18-21, there was the breastplate or the chest piece. Um, it was it, it was a pouch-like garment. A pouch-like garment. Uh, the materials in the chest piece were gold purple, blue, and scarlet, uh, scarlet yarn and fine linen. That's how they made it. In Exodus 39, 22 through 26, uh, this is the robe of the Ephraim. The Ephraim robe symbolizes the prayer ministry of the high priest. In verses 27 through 29, uh, there was the elder garments for the other priests. Now they're gone from Eric to Aaron's sons, and I'm making garments of them. Uh, the priestly garment was symbolized, symbolized of putting on God's righteousness. They had a tunic of fine linen were made of a weave, weaves made by a weaver. Uh, the tunic were made of fine linen, and as well as the headband. Uh, the undergarments were made of fine twine, fine twisted linen. Uh, the sash for each Piece was made of fine linen and multicolored garment. In verses 30 and 31, you see there was the gold medallion. The medallion symbolizes that the high priest bore the gold or the guilt for the shortcomings of all the people. In Exodus 39, 32 through 43, you have the work of the tabernacle. All of this had been completed. Once it was finally completed, Moses, and he took everything to Moses. Moses reviewed everything, and it had taken a long, long way of time to get there. The tabernacle of God was built and complete by his people. Now, that's chapter 39. Now, I didn't want to get into chapter 40 because I knew we would not have enough time to deal with chapter 40 on this evening. But I do want to deal with chapter 40 on next week, and we will wrap up Exodus, and then we will move on to where God is going to lead us in dealing and showing us more about the new place of worship. Uh, but chapter 40 is very important because this is where they dedicate the place, and this is where God comes in, and his presence fills the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And from this point going forward, this the Ark of the Covenant becomes a symbol of God's presence. Wherever the Ark is, you had a symbol of God's presence. So that's why when you see churches throughout the community, it is a symbol of God's presence. Okay? Uh, but but I don't want to run into that on next week. So we'll talk about all that on next week. Now, for Zoom, you know, whatever comments you would like to share from these three chapters will be just great. I did not mention anything specific, and I know that, and that was intentional. So look forward to sharing whatever you like to share about these chapters. It may not be something that we talked about. It may be something that you have read and that you saw in those three chapters that you would like to share with us. We'll take a moment and we'll share about that as well on Zoom on Friday. I'm looking forward to seeing you on Friday, uh, but if I don't see you on Friday, I look forward to seeing you on Sunday. If I don't see you on Sunday, I look forward to seeing you on next Wednesday. And also, next Friday after that is also Christmas. So we're looking forward to coming together during that time and having a wonderful time and sharing in Zoom as well. Pray that you and your families are not so busy that you can't steal away for an hour that we can share with one another just for an hour with each other. Know that God loves you. Know that God is concerned about you. Know that we are praying for you. Know that we are here for you. Know that you are not in this by yourself. Know that this too shall pass. Know that God is working this thing out for his glory and for our good. And I want you to know that we're going to come out on the other side of this 
a whole lot stronger than we have ever been before in our lives. Know that I love you. Know that I'm praying for you. Know that I'm here for you. I pray that you have a blessed evening, and I will see you Friday on Zoom. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity that you have allowed us to share. Lord, we ask that you would minister unto us on a continual basis of your word, Lord God. Continue to feed, to guide, and direct us, Lord God. Father, cover us, Lord God. Father, dismiss us from this place, Lord God. But never, ever dismiss us from your presence, Lord God. Father, this we ask in your son Jesus' name and for his sakes. Amen.